What are some of the dumbest crimes people will actually commit? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, let me be as clear as possible. Las Vegas rapper Ken Juan McDaniel, otherwise known as the biggest Finn 4800 on YouTube, found himself facing charges after inadvertently confessing to a crime in one of his music videos. The artist was arrested and charged in connection with the passing of Randall Wallace. McDaniel had been a person of interest in the case, with his car allegedly matching the description of the one used at the crime scene. However, it wasn't until a Las Vegas detective stumbled upon McDaniel's music video for the song Fade Free on YouTube that the case was blown wide open. In the music video, McDaniel essentially released what authorities believe to be a confession. The lyrics in question basically amounts to McDaniel bragging about his crime and the fact that he's the reason that Wallace's mom was crying. Police immediately took interest. The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department released a statement revealing that detectives noticed a lot of similarities between the details of the crime and the content of McDaniel's music video. The video also apparently validated the results of the ongoing investigation as it contained information about the crime not publicly released and not common knowledge. When the crime took place, witnesses described a man that fit McDaniel's description fled the scene in a white car right after some sort of altercation. By the time help arrived, Randall Wallace, the victim, was already gone. Police knew that Wallace had been involved in some sort of argument with three other people, but they didn't know who those people were. Then months later, John McDaniel became a person of interest after his car matched the description provided by the witnesses. But it wasn't until the release of his music video that law enforcement got the breakthrough they needed for an arrest. The music video, featuring McDaniel and friends with digital skeletal masks covering their faces, probably just to be spooky before Halloween, included specific details and movements that police said were consistent with evidence at the crime scene. McDaniel's arrest also brought to light his previous legal troubles, as he was already on probation for going after four people inside the Boulevard Mall in Las Vegas. This guy sounds like a real sweetheart. In addition to those charges, McDaniel also faced allegations of violating parole from previous crimes. He is currently being held on a $1 million bail with electronic monitoring. He's like a real-life gun rack. Number five, bad grandpa. In an attempt to fool airport officials and board a flight to New York, 32-year-old Jayesh Patel of India disguised himself as an 81-year-old using a fake passport. The plan involved Patel dyeing his beard white, donning a turban, and wearing glasses while being wheeled through the airport in a wheelchair. His efforts, however, were thwarted at New Delhi Airport when security personnel became suspicious of his age and appearance. Patel, who used the name Amrik Singh on the forged passport, with a birth date of February 1, 1938, caught the attention of the Central Industrial Security Force, or CISF, when he refused to undergo a routine frisk search, claiming he was too old to stand. The CISF officers, noticing that Patel avoided eye contact, decided to investigate further. Patel's skin appeared noticeably younger than that of an octogenarian. Apparently, Patel had hired someone to give him the fake passport, and Patel had agreed to pay a substantial amount upon reaching the United States, where he intended to get a job. Patel's disguise, while not terrible, drew attention due to the extreme age he chose. A more realistic age, such as 65, might have been a better choice to avoid raising suspicion about a person seeking permanent residency. After being detained for questioning, Patel eventually admitted his real identity. Doesn't this remind you of that old trope where kids dress like old people to sneak into a movie? Has that ever worked? Number four, testing Elon. Vermont man Michael Gonzalez was sentenced to four years in prison for exploiting a Tesla loophole that allowed him to receive five high-end cars without making any payments. He managed to trick Tesla into delivering $560,000 worth of vehicles without settling the payment, later selling three of them to unsuspecting buyers and pocketing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Gonzalez's method involved entering bank details with insufficient funds into Tesla's online payment 
payment portal. Exploiting the flaw in the system, Tesla delivered the cars and certificates of ownership to Gonzalez in Vermont before the transactions were completed. It wasn't until days later that Tesla discovered the accounts provided by Gonzalez had insufficient funds, making this a low wattage scam that highlighted a significant flaw in Tesla's payment processing system. The thing that makes it so dumb is that Gonzalez's plan wasn't really thought out, like at all. As soon as he encountered trouble securing the title for one of the cars, a $153,000 Tesla Model X, he drove the vehicle onto a frozen lake and set it on fire, subsequently filing an insurance claim for the damages. Gonzalez pleaded guilty to five counts of possessing and disposing of stolen vehicles just days before the trial was set to begin. As part of his plea deal, he agreed to pay Tesla $493,000 in restitution and forfeit his $231,900 in profits to the government. Gonzalez's plan to exploit Tesla's system without using a fake identity left an obvious trail, so it was only a matter of time before he would be caught. Like, he literally used his own name and address as if Tesla wouldn't think to show up looking for the cars when payment fell through. What was the plan here, Michael? Or is it you're just not a details type of guy? Number three, let's count this bread. Michael Gale Nash attempted to rob a First National Bank in Anchorage, but was promptly apprehended while he was waiting outside the bank for the money. Outside the branch, he just tried to rob. And the best part was that the Alaskan bank robber had already been arrested for robbing that same bank and was caught in a similar way. Nash's first attempt at robbing the same bank was notably flawed. Dressed in all black like a ninja, he handed a teller a note demanding money, but his name and birthday date were scrawled on the back, essentially leaving a signature for law enforcement. After the failed attempt, Nash earned a spot on various dumbest criminals lists, but not one to just give up on a good plan. Nash reappeared at the First National Bank in Anchorage, clad in a similar black ensemble. This time, he arrived at the bank at 9 a.m., an hour before its scheduled opening. Tugging hard at the front doors, Nash refused to listen to the employee's warnings that the bank wasn't yet open for business. Nash must have just thought now was the time Time, whether the bank was open or not, so he passed a note through the locked doors to a bank supervisor, which said that this was a robbery to put the money in a bag and that he'd walk out. Note, he wasn't actually in the bank when he said he'd walk out. He then reminded the supervisor that it was, in fact, a robbery and for God to help them all. Unlike his previous attempt, Nash this time didn't include his personal information on the note, so uh, that's progress. Reacting quickly, the supervisor initiated a secondary locking mechanism, securing bank doors and dialed 911. Nash, however, continued loitering in front of the branch, displaying signs of agitation. Law enforcement arrived on the scene, and Nash, seemingly resigned to his fate, peacefully submitted to arrest. During the apprehension, he made several excited comments that it wasn't his first time robbing a bank. With a criminal record that includes prior convictions for stealing personal property, forgery, and a court-martial for distributing illegal substances, Nash now faces the possibility of a much more extended stay behind bars with a potential prison sentence of up to 20 years. Number two, Cheeto dust. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, a home invasion took a cheesy twist, leading to the arrest of the intruder, Sharon Carr. Police found Cheeto's residue in her teeth and were able to link her to the crime scene. The incident unfolded when the Tulsa Police Department responded to a call reporting an attempted burglary. A woman had apparently tried to force her way in through a window, prompting a swift police response. Upon arriving at the scene, investigators discovered an empty bag of Cheetos puffs and a bottle of water near the open window. It appeared that the intruder later identified identified as Sharon Carr, had dropped the snack during a hasty exit from the home. Because even if you're performing a little breaking and entering, you still might want some snacks. And Carr was prepared. The female victim, who was alone in the residence with two small children, told 911 that the intruder had pried a screen door off her window but had not taken anything. As officers were still investigating the scene, Carr weirdly emerged from the shadows after having fled when she realized someone was home during the break-in. The victim positively identified her as the burglar too. But what about evidence? Well, Carr's connection to the crime crystallized when 
officer saw Cheeto's residue stuck in her teeth. The disgusting orange bits of food stuck in her teeth provided a critical link between Carr and the attempted burglary. The Tulsa Police Department posted about it on Facebook, commenting as a PSA that Cheeto's dust can be difficult to deal with. Carr was promptly arrested on a charge of first-degree burglary. Interestingly, she offered no explanation for her actions, leaving everyone confused as to what on earth she was doing. Well, we all have the same guess, right? It's generally considered savvy in the criminal underworld to leave zero evidence at the scene of the crime, and to maybe snack before you go and try to break into someone's house. Also, probably wait until the person isn't home. Or, better yet, let's just not break into people's houses. If you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned for our past release to find out some of the smartest crimes instead. Number one, the sign that he's there. In an attempt to throw law enforcement off his trail, Florida man Johnny Yates, who was wanted by the police for charges of aggravated battery, false imprisonment, and tampering, resorted to a clever strategy. So he put a sign outside his home that said that Johnny Yates didn't live there. It's worth a shot, right? Deputies, acting on a tip that Yates was inside the house, went to pay him a visit. They were greeted by a dry erase board message boldly proclaiming Yates' absence. But the deputies weren't buying what the deceitful sign was selling and questioned someone who was leaving the house. And the person was a total snitch who confirmed that Yates was actually in the house despite the sign. We well, you know, you're probably like, wow, this video took a turn. Who do police believe? The sign saying Yates didn't live there or their informant they spoke to saying he was inside. Well, the police listened to their informant. Despite surrounding the residents and calling for Yates to come out with his hands up and giving him ample opportunity to comply, law enforcement faced resistance. So they decided to deploy what they called surrender smoke inside the house, which probably just makes the house real smoky, but it'd be awesome if it smelled like farts too, right? It goes from sounding cool to wondering how we can get some. Anyway, four people ran out. Yates was still hiding inside. Since since the surrender smoke didn't get Yates to come out, law enforcement then entered the residence with the help of canine, finding Yates hiding in a modified chest of drawers. Yates was taken into custody and transported to jail to face the charges against him. The four individuals initially found inside the house with Yates were also arrested. And can't you just see this loser telling the story about how he got away in his head to his friends while he was hiding? Like his dumb idea actually worked because he's so slick? The story reminds us of those old cartoons where Wile E. Coyote is chasing Roadrunner and Roadrunner puts up a sign with an arrow causing Wile E. Coyote to run into a wall. Using Monopoly money to scam a jeweler for diamonds isn't the craziest scam in this video. One group of guys also duped victims into believing they were buying lamps that had genies in it. Number four, Monopoly money. Bruno Nikolic was arrested and jailed for using Monopoly money in million dollar deals and he's just one member of a big family operation. His brother, Giuliano, and their father, Dragoslav, along with gang leaders Gianni Akamo and Dusika Nikolic, conspired to covertly swap real cash with toy money when it was time to pay up. Basically, they would hide the fake money among the real cash to make the deal go through. Then they used a unique desk to swap many real notes with Monopoly money during the exchanges. The family defrauded their clients out of more than 7 million pounds. The Nikolic family didn't shy away from their crimes when faced with an expert, despite the risk. They went on to scam the world-famous master jeweler John Kalea out of 6.1 million pounds. Kalea has designed diamond masks, bracelets, and necklaces for celebrity catwalks and prestigious events, and worn by people such as Madonna and members of the royal family. Some of his other clients include Zara Phillips and Colin Firth. Kalea is especially famous for his pink diamond designer collection, which has won him many awards worldwide. So when the Nikolic family struck a deal with Kalea, they knew they'd struck more than gold. They hit diamonds. Gang member Gianni Akamo, claiming to be a gem expert, inspected Kalea's stones at the Covent Garden Hotel and offered him a deal. When it came time to exchange the cash for the diamonds, Kalea and his bodyguard worked to funnel the money into a cash counting machine. When they turned their backs for just a moment to put the device away, 
the gang members switched the genuine euros for bundles of Monopoly money using paper bands to cover the word Monopoly on the bills. Once the process was complete, Kalea handed over the jewels from his shop in the Royal Arcade on London's Old Bond Street. It wasn't until the Nikolic's were long gone that he realized they scammed him out of millions. But Kalea wasn't the only one. They also carried out their crime spree in Bristol and Leeds. In Bristol, jeweler Jack Cohen was defrauded of 420,000 pounds. Members of the Nikolic family met him outside of the Marriott Hotel and handed over real euros for the watches and a cashier's check for the diamonds. But there was a problem with the cashier's check. So the Nikolic's agreed to pay the balance for the diamonds with euros. Cohen was given a bundle of Monopoly money and didn't realize it wasn't real currency until the next day when it was too late. Police eventually found some of the fraudsters at a house in Nottingham where they had a stock of fake money, 150 pounds worth of sterling silver, euros, and dollars. There was also an ample supply of jewelry hidden under the soil in plant pots. Akamo, Dusica, Jordovic, Giuliano, and Bruno were arrested for the scam. Akamo was sent to jail for six years, Dusica for two, Jordovic for seven, Giuliano for four, and Bruno for 22 months. Bruno Nikolic, one of the fraudsters at the center of the scam, was released from jail after after his 22-month sentence. But he didn't learn his lesson and committed more crimes. In 2016, he used one of his kids as a distraction while grabbing a diamond necklace and five diamond rings from a display window at the Marshalls Yard Center in Gainsborough. He was convicted of theft in July 2017 and was jailed for another two years. But it seems like he still didn't learn his lesson. He's been accused of stealing diamonds from a private home and is now fighting extradition to Germany. He was caught driving without a license or insurance and was disqualified from obtaining a permit for a year. According to the judge, it seems like Bruno's extradition is a sure thing and he'll be leaving his pregnant wife behind. Number three, baby formula. In 2022, mothers were shocked to find empty shelves that were supposed to be stocked the baby formula their babies depended on. Nine years before the critical shortage, people were starting to tamper with the U.S. supply of essential baby formula. In 2017, a trio of two men and one woman were arrested for their role in a fraud scheme that made them more than $200 million in profits. Sharita Nabi, Johnny Grobman, and Raul Doki got in on the ground floor by convincing U.S. infant formula manufacturers to sell them products at discounted rates, sometimes up to 60% off the original price. They claimed they had a government tender to purchase the formula on behalf of Suriname in South America. But instead of sending the product to Suriname as they promised, the trio turned around and sold their hoard of baby formula to U.S. citizens at full price. To secure these huge discounts, Nabi, Grobman, and Doki negotiated with baby formula manufacturers, promising to deliver the baby formula to mothers in the impoverished country of Suriname in South America. Doki and Nabi set up a company based out of Suriname called Tropical Marketing and Distribution NV. They created a fictional government office called the Suriname Tender Office to provide false documentation to support their scheme. They wrote out a government tender to show the companies they were scamming, proving that they were obtaining baby formula on behalf of the nation of Suriname. Groban also listed himself as the manager of several fake companies to make them look more authentic. The trio worked together to create false false purchase orders, shipping the products abroad, and then immediately bringing them back into the U.S. in a process called U-turning. Grobman submitted fraudulent shipping documents to U.S. agents to get the tons of baby formula past customs. Sometimes they didn't ship the product at all. One witness at trial took the stand to say that the fraudsters covertly switched the stock of baby formula in shipping containers with sheetrock of the same weight. They replaced the cargo seals installed by the infant formula manufacturers to prevent tampering and used a machine to create ideas identical markings to avoid getting caught by customs officials and formula manufacturers. A fourth man, Edgar Torres, collaborated with the fraudsters to pose as a registered agent of La Mer Transport, a phony freight forwarding company. Groban and Torres used their shell companies to sell the infant formula back to American distributors and split the profits with the two other accomplices. They defrauded about 60 companies and used their $200 million profits to buy a $9 million mansion in Florida, a 48-foot yacht, and seven 
several international estates. But one time, things didn't go according to plan. In 2017, one manufacturer cut off business with the two after a truck driver warned the company about upcoming delays. A closer investigation into their operation revealed that their exports to Suriname were a complete lie. After a 13-day trial in February 2020, a federal jury found the trio guilty of wire fraud, money laundering, and smuggling goods from the United States. Grobman, Doki, and Nabi were sentenced to 18 years in federal prison and were forced to hand over $200 million. Grobman requested a retrial, which the judge quickly denied. Number two, Lego My Legos. In May 2022, English couple Lee Hickenbottom and his partner Tabitha Knott were caught stealing more than 1 million pounds of taxpayers' money and using it to buy luxury cars, expensive vacations, and top-of-the-line Lego sets. They also spent hundreds of thousands to renovate their home in Dudley, including a 13,000-pound hot tub that was so big it had to be crane-lifted in. They spent more than 250,000 pounds on luxury cars, 18,000 pounds on iTunes, and of course, 16,000 pounds on Apple products. But the weirdest purchase has to have been the £1,500 spent on expensive Lego sets. Hickenbottom set up a fake transport business, Serenity Community Transport Limited, to submit claims for repayment from HMRC, which stands for Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. From 2014 to 2017, the pair claimed £1.2 million in VAT related to more than £7 million in fake invoices. But what's a VAT? VAT stands for Value Added Tax. Basically, it's a tax on goods and services paid at each level of the supply chain from the initial manufacture to the point of sale. It's used instead of an income tax to raise money for the government based on consumption rather than salary. Most countries in the European Union use a VAT system, but the United States does not. That being said, many people scam the VAT system using something called a carousel scheme in which a fraudulent trader imports goods without VAT and then sells the items to a distributing accomplice who charges clients for VAT. The distributor sells the items to a series of other companies who all pay the VAT, until it's nearly impossible to track the manufacturer and distributor who first sold and bought the goods without VAT. At that point, those companies have already reclaimed VAT from the government and made a profit on the tax they never paid. HMRC officers eventually found out about the fraud after investigating some of the claims, even after Hickenbottom tried to cover his tracks by transferring £340,000 to family and friends and sending £76,000 to not. In 2020, Hickenbottom pleaded guilty to dishonest claims of 28 thousand pounds in job seekers allowance and employment support allowance from 2013 to 2016. He and his partner were found guilty of VAT fraud in March 2022 after being tried at Birmingham Crown Court. Not was also convicted of money laundering. Hickenbottom was sentenced to eight years in prison and not received 18 months with a two-year suspension. Number one, the genie. When Dr. Laik Khan met a group of occultists with a magical genie lamp in India, he couldn't believe his eyes. He even saw a magical jinn appear from the lamp. Dr. Khan asked to touch the genie and take the lamp home, but the men refused, saying it could cause serious harm. But Dr. Khan couldn't live without his magical genie. The men sold the lamp to him for a whopping 71,000 pounds, promising that it would bring him health, wealth, and good fortune for the rest of his life. But soon after taking the lamp home, Dr. Khan realized the magical lamp didn't have any powers, and he'd been scammed out of thousands of pounds, amounting to 7 million rupees. The jinn he saw emerge from the lamp was just one of the men in a costume. He reported the crime to police in the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. Luckily, the police found the scammers and arrested them in November 2020. One of their wives, who was in on the scam, went on the run. These men have scammed several people using the same genie plot and made millions of rupees in the process. A genie, the plural from jinn, is a spirit from Arabic mythology that inhabits the earth, supposedly unseen by humans. They can take on many forms and make magical things happen through their immense powers. You've all seen Aladdin, right? But jinnies can be good or evil and can be punished and killed just like humans. Encounters with jinnies are super rare according to the Quran since humans can't usually see them. So it's no wonder Dr. Khan took the opportunity to take a genie home once he saw one emerge from the lamp. Unfortunately for him, this was far from a real genie. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you would rather have. The ability to speak all languages fluently or the ability to eat whatever you want without gaining weight.